Okay, Aita, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, welcome. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, this is a talk on how to write modern video camera driver for Linux. And I would like to use an example as a well-known framework which is going through a removal or deprecation process to show how the system we work on has changed since the time that framework has been implemented. And hopefully I would like to give some suggestion and examples if you have drivers depending on said framework on how to make them, on how to remove those dependencies and have your driver working for next kernel re releases. So these are a few of my contacts. My name is Jacopo. This is my email address. Uh, this is my IRC contact. I'm an embedded Linux and free software developer and I work as a consultant and I've been lucky enough to work with the uh, excellent Renaissance uh, mainline kernel team in the last two years, which gave me the opportunity to contribute to Linux in a kind of a regular way. Uh, I would like to thank Renaissance, of course, for sponsoring me and supporting in giving this talk and this day uh, the activities. And that's the talk outline. So we're gonna look at what's happening at SOC Camera, which is the framework that I've been talking about, and what has changed since the day that SOC Camera has been implemented. Uh, the main difference is that how system boots, because we have moved from a world where system boots are using board files to, 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 to firmware uh, supported boot process. And that changes the way we discover and probe and create devices. Power management has changed as well. That depends on how the image capture devices are show up in user space. And finally, I would like to give a practical example of a driver that was developed for SSC camera and has been made a modern Linux, video for Linux driver in uh, recent kernel releases. I would like also to introduce a bit of glossary because words are sometimes confusing and to capture images, we need of course an image sensor that produces those images and the receiving port which is usually installed on the SOC. A sensor driver controls an image sensor and the bridge or receiver driver controls the receiving port on the SOC. On modern system, we, have, we still have an image sensor that produce images and an image receiver, but we also have several components on the SOC that takes care of image transformation and manipulation. Image sensor and drivers for those kind of components are generally called video sub-device driver. Let's start by discussing what's happening to SOC camera and start by saying that SOC camera was great in my opinion. And can I ask how many people here have ever worked with SOC cameras? Okay, just a few, but. So if you work with that framework, you know it, it was great because it provides you a nice abstraction away for the crude v V4L2 API, which might be kind of scary if that's the first video driver you have to write. It's kind of scary to deal with all the complexity of the video for Linux API, all the uh, IOCTLs you have to take, take care of, buffer allocation, and SSC camera abstracted all those things away in a nice way, and that's why it was adopted in a lot of driver in mainline. And I don't have statistics for that, but I, my feeling is that in BSPs and in downstream kernels, it was kind of everywhere. All the BSPs kernel I've been working with, uh, if they have a camera driver, it was based on SSC camera. And it was so adopted because it has good points, like as I've said, it provided a nice abstraction away for V4L2. It's the same framework for writing bridges and sensor drivers. So you learn one framework, you write two drivers, that was nice. And also it provides an easy way to link bridge driver to sensor drivers because the two of them had to be linked in order for the bridge driver to call separation on the sensor one. Of course, there is a bad side, since we are removing that, there is a bad side, of course. And SSC camera was developed in a time where system booted through board files, and this support for uh, OF, or device tree, and nowadays ECPI, which is gaining traction in better systems well, is limited. It is there, I know, but it's limited, and we're gonna see why. It uses a set of deprecated operation, which is a fixable thing, but while the V4L2 API evolved, 
the uh, SC camera framework using those API has not been evolving the same way. So this is fixable, but it's not been done so far. And more than everything else, the media controller and subdev API that have been introduced like five, six years ago are actual game changers because they change the way that how image capture devices show up in user space. So they change, SOC camera haven't really kept up with that. And what's happening to SOC camera? SOC cameras, it's deprecated for a long time, so you are suggested not to use that for write drivers, but it's gonna be removed, finally, because it's a long time we're gonna, we, that talks about that, possibly in the next kernel release. Uh, the last SOC camera bridge driver has been removed, has been ported to be a VDF Linux driver last year, so there are no more platforms that depend on that framework. Although there are some sensor driver in the order of tens, 10 of them pro probably, that have not been ported yet, and they're gonna be possibly removed. There are discussions these days if moving them to staging or, moving that, or removing them completely. It's possible they're gonna be removed completely. And that's the file organization. We know that platform bridge drivers are usually in driver's media platform and SOC camera drivers are driver's media platform SOC camera. And here we have no more dependencies. While for uh, drivers media I2C, where sensor drivers are, we have some of them which, have, which will be removed. Currently, in mainline, we have kind of a confusing situation because we have two drivers from the same device, which is kind of confusing, but from next to release, this is, this is going away. So there are drivers here that needs to be ported here, and that's work to do. If somebody would like to contribute to that, it's, it's a nice thing to do. What has changed then since the time when SOC camera was implemented? As we said, the device discovery and linking mechanism has changed. Nowadays we do that using notifiers and async ma matching. Power, man power management has changed as well due to the way how video devices are exposed in user space. And we now have fra standard frameworks for clock and regulators. And so SOC camera doesn't use deprecated frameworks for that. So every time it's, it's possible, we should use the standard frameworks for dealing with th those two things. Let's start talking about device probing and have a look at the, how device probe was performed in the legacy way. So we have five components here, board files, bridge driver, SOC camera, sensor driver, and of course the video for Linux 2 framework. The board file is nothing but the plain C file that registers devices and drivers one after the other, all devices in the system. And at a certain point, it will add the uh, platform driver for the bridge driver. So that causes the bridge driver to probe. At the end of the probe section uh, of the probe function, uh, the bridge driver will probably register itself to the SOC camera framework. That causes the SOC camera to do all the initialization operation and at a certain point, it will start registering I2C devices. How does it do that? It does that using a V4L2 function, which is this one, V4L2 I2C new sub board, which creates a new I2C device that causes the sensor driver to probe. And how are those two identified? Well, the board file knows the I2C bus number and the I2C address of the device and passes it down to the, in the call chain until here, where, which, uh, where those two information are used to identify the sensor driver. So in the old world, we have that devices are identified by the I2C addresses, and more important than everything, the device probing is sequential. So we have the bridge driver probing before the sensor driver. And that guarantees that every time a sensor driver probes, it has a bridge driver to connect to. In the new world, we have, we have moved to a uh, firmware-based boot process. So nowadays, devices are creating parsing a firmware description of the system, and the devices are not identified anymore by I2C addresses, by the firmware node references. And again, more important than everything, there is no guarantee anymore on the probing order of, this, of the drivers. So this is a DTS, and in the DTS, we have a description of a video input port here, and of an I2C bus. On the I2C bus, there is a sensor identified by an address, 
and the system boots, Linux boots, and start parsing the DTS until it, it, it finds the video input port nodes. That causes the bridge driver to probe, and at a certain point, it starts parsing the I2C bus, which creates the sensor driver, which probes again and can safely connect to the bridge driver. But we can also have the other way around. So the I2C bus is registered before the video input port. This is probed first, and the sensor driver probes, completes its probe operation, but find, finds no one there to register to. And that might be a problem. It's actually a problem, because now device probing is totally asynchronous. We have no guarantees, which is the probing order. And again, we need to identify devices by the firmware node references. How to do that? Well, V4L2 framework to the rescue here, because it has two components that are designed for helping you, help drivers doing that exactly, which are V4L2 async and V4L2 FW node. How do they work and how drivers use them? Well, we have a bridge driver again, DTS, and the two framework components. And in DTS, we have a description of the input port and the output ports of the bridge driver, which has two ports connected to two remote endpoints, which are possibly sensor or sub-devices driver. The, sense, the bridge driver probes and uses a V4L2 FW node framework to parse the DTS and collect references to the remote endpoints. Those two are collected in the form of V4L2 async subdevice, which is an abstraction provided to you by this part of the framework. And those two devices are collected by the bridge driver. What does the bridge, the bridge driver do with that? The bridge driver stores them in what is called a notifier. It's actually a V4L2 async notifier which is provided, defined by this part of the framework. A notifier is nothing but a collection of um, firmware node references the bridge driver or a generic driver is waiting for. V4L2 Asyncs maintains a list of all notifier registers in the system. Now we have three, four in total, which is kind of likely in a system, but it's possible, totally possible. And the bridge driver does nothing but register its notifier with the devices it's waiting for to the V4L2 async. V4L2 asyncs uh, maintains as well a list of waiting devices. These are devices or sub-devices that probed and no one is waiting for them. So they're put in the waiting list. At a certain point in time, we have that the sensor driver probes eventually, and it uses V4L2 FW node to parse its local endpoint and create a V4L2 async subdevice um, representation of itself. It will then register that to V4L2 asyncs, which adds them to the list of waiting devices, but the two of them get matched, so there is someone waiting for this sensor. When the two of them get matched, that causes the V4L2 async to call a callback on the, on the bridge driver that bounds the sub-device to the driver. So in this way, the bridge will have and handle a reference to the sensor driver. The second, well, okay, we are waiting for two sensor drivers, and the second sensor eventually will probably in future does the same things usually V4L2 FW node create a V4L2 async subdevice representation of itself and register that to V4L2 async. That causes the same the device to be matched and the subdevice bound and the bound and the bound callback to be called on the bridge driver. And so in this way, the bridge has reference to both the sensor driver is waiting for. Uh, there is another thing I've not shown uh, I have not shown here, which is uh, there's no, not only the bound callback, there is this thing called complete callback that it's usually called when all the sub-device notifier, or all the, not, the su asynchronous sub-device the notifier is waiting for have been registered. The complete callback is usually called here. The complete callback usually called, uh, creates all the um, user space representations, so video device node and video sub-device node connected to the wall capturing uh, infrastructure. There is a discussion going on nowadays. If it's a good thing, if you have eight, let's say you're waiting for eight cameras 
and one of them is not probing, do you want your system to be working or not? So should complete be called only when all these sub-devices have probed, or sometimes it's a good thing to have a working system, even if one of your sub-devices or camera fails? There will be discussion about that in the uh, video for Linux 2 meeting on two days from now, and let's see what's happened there. Of course, that's what we show so far is the situation where the bridge driver probes first, but we wanted to solve a problem which is the asynchronous probing uh, problems, so the sensor may probe first. So the sensor probes, uses V4L2FW node to register its async sub-device, and that gets added to the waiting list. Nobody's waiting for them because there are no notifiers waiting for this sub-device, but in a certain point in the future, the bridge driver probes and will register a notifier waiting for this device. The two of them gets matched, and the two of them gets connected. So we effectively solve the problem of async, uh, probing sequences using those two frameworks. And the ones of you that knows SOC Camera knows that SOC Camera can do that, actually does that. It uses those two frameworks and so why, it, what has changed since then? What has changed since the time where SOC camera uh, has been implemented is that now sub-devices can have notifiers as well. This has been introduced one year ago by Nicholas, Sakari, and Laurent, which are the main author of the uh, V4L2 Async and V4L2 FW node frameworks to support the Renaissance Archer CSI in infrastructure, which as sub-devices that are connected to sensors. So we moved from a situation where we have a receiver which has a notifier and connects to a sub-device to a situation where a sub-device can have a sub-notifier. And eventually that sub-notifier sub will be connected to, to other sub-devices. This can create a chain of arbitrary complexity. It's usually just one of two level, but there's nothing preventing you from making more complicated things here. And right now, I think a couple of driver mainlines are usually that. IMX, well, our car for sure, but also IMX is now using sub-device notifier, and it's expected that more devices will use uh, this abstraction as well. Power management. As we said, power management has changed as well due to the way that uh, video devices are now represented in user space, and that's depends on the way, on the introduction of media controller and sub-dev API. So media controller, the old device, the old world, non-media controller keep devices, they work with a single device node abstraction. So the one that we were all are used to, the dev video zero abstraction. So for a wall capturing infrastructure, you just have a single device node in user space. And that causes all operation to be sequential, they go through a single device node and gets directed to the sub-device. We now live in a world where media controller is everywhere and it's going to be everywhere, hopefully in the next year. And video device nodes are not the only abstraction we have in user space because we have also video sub-device node. And that causes all operation not to be sequential anymore but instead they can be uh, performed on sub-devices and video devices at the same time. So let's see an example of that. This is a legacy system where we have the simplest possible capture infrastructure. So we have a sensor that is connected to an I2C bus and it's connected to a receiver port where it transmits pixels. In kernel space, they will be um, uh, they will be managed by a receiver driver, a sensor driver, and that's the framework part, which is common to the two, to the, the, the kernel frameworks. And the user space, we will have just a single device node abstraction. So all this infrastructure here is represented by a single device node. We have, of course, a V4L2 compliant application, and which interfaces with all that with the V4L2 APIs. Usually, at the first thing we, operation we have to do if you want to use the video device, it's to call an open on this video device node. And usually, at set power, uh, at open time, the bridge driver just powers up the sensor. So in that way, 
every other operation, the sensor driver is ready to, uh, to send pixel to the receiver. So the V4L2 compliant applications start calling uh, ver different IOCTLs, set formats, get formats, allocate buffers, whatever, and a certain point, and all the operation will be translated by the receiver driver to the sensor driver using a V4L2 subdev call operation. At a certain point, we will receive a stream on, so the application won't actually, the sensor to stream pixels and this causes a lot of settings to be sent on the ISCRC bus, and Pixel will start flowing in this direction. This is, what, this is what a modern device might look like, a very simplified, actually, modern device might look like. So we still have a sensor, we still have a receiver port, but we also have a lot of components on the SOC that takes care of image transformation and manipulation that can be resizing, conversion between one format and another, uh, formatting system memory, depend, totally depends on your platform. And of course, the uh, drivers that handle that are much more uh, different from the legacy one, and they might have different components. They, you may have one ISP driver handling all three of them, uh, one receiver driver, that depends on your platform. But the important thing is that this is how it would look like in user space. So we still have the video device not zero, which the application uses to start streaming and call a certain set of operation, but we also have all these device nodes here, which are sub-device nodes, where the application can call sub-dev operation as well. So this is what may happen. We may have video uh, sub-devices IOCTLs call on video sub-device node at any, any time. And there is no relationship between one and the other, so we might have those two call at different times. And that causes all of your operation to be now asynchronous because there is not a shared notation of power settings anymore along all this pipeline. So the only thing, the only suggestion that I have for if you are to implement a driver in this kind of situation is always cache your settings every time because you never know the power state your driver is working in. You might receive a set format and your sensor might not be powered at all because we don't have the single entry point we had when working with no media controller systems. That calls for maintaining a driver-wise power state notation. Every time you should know if your device is powered or not. And even better, if you want to make that ref counted, it's even better because if you receive two set power, that should not happen. But who knows what user space is doing. You should receive two uh, power off to, uh, to actually power off the device. Also, you should cache all your settings and apply them at a time where it's known the sensor or the sub-devices to be powered. And it, that's usually stream-on time, because when you receive a stream-on, you, you should start sending pixel, and at that time, the sensor should be powered on. Also, this is a general suggestion for not just for video devices, but try to use runtime PM. Runtime PM makes, provides you an abstraction that it's more similar to the sequential flow of operation that we've seen before. So it easy development and ref counting of power states. Of course, it's not always possible, but it's welcome. Clocks, GPOs, and regulators. As said, we have frameworks for that right now, and they should be used whenever possible. And Relating to power management routine, in the legacy world, we have the, the board file that provided power management routine to the sensor. So this is how SOC camera used to do that. There is an SOC camera link with a, a, a power callback, and the board file just filled that pointer with a, a routine defined in the board file. So when the driver needed to power up and power off the sensor, it called these things here, and the board file has all the references to regulators, resets, whatever it needs to power on and off the sensor. Of course, we don't have board files anymore. We have DTS or ACPI. And how would you do that? 
well, you should use the GPIO clock and regulator frameworks. Every time they interface with the DTS, you collect references from firmware, which is usually called DevM or not DevM, depending if you want to use a, a DevM clock or regulators get and use the name using DTS. And the driver itself should not rely anymore on the board files, turning on and off the, the, the singular components, but it's the driver itself that should enable or disable uh, the, the, comp the, the regulators or the reset line at s, s power time. Practical, so this is an example of a video driver that was, as, was developed using the SOC camera and in recent, uh, I think two releases ago, has been ported to be a plain video for Linux two drivers. So I would like to go through all the patch, not all of them, but some patches that, and show you how, what are the steps that has been uh, performed to do that in order, if you have any driver depending on SC camera and you want to port them and possibly submit them for inclusion, that's a kind of, of a guidelines for doing that. So the first thing we did was just copy the sensor driver as it was from SSC camera to the video for Linux 2 sensor driver directory. That was a choice that allowed us to see the differences without having any modification in the first commit. Then the first commit actually removed all the dependencies from SSC camera from the driver and that's exactly what we, what we have been talking about. So, uh, handling clock and GPIOs in the drivers and not relying on the board file for doing that. Register the async subdevice because SOC camera was doing that for you and now you should do that explicitly in your driver. Remove SOC camera specific uh, deprecated operation. In video for Linux, two, these operations are, uh, well, are deprecated. SOC camera still depends on that and still wants them. So they had to be removed and re-implemented in the proper set format and get format operation. And then there are a few changes which are specific to, G to this driver, which are specific to this driver, so I'm just here for reference. Of course, the build system has to be adjusted, but that's trivial. And then, after uh, a plain video for Linux 2 driver has been made out of the SOC camera depending one, uh, the fun begin because people actually start using that and that's exciting because patches are start coming so people actually start using that and specifically patches have been adding components, parts of to that driver that made the modern video for Linux driver out of what it was an old one. So the first thing we saw was adding media controller support to this driver. That means that the driver now has a sub device as a subdevice in you, as a subdevice in user space, so you now need to s handle nested set power calls. That's exactly the thing that cache your setting and keep a, a, a power nota power state notation in your driver. Also, you should not access registers when the sensor is powered down. Now you can receive a get uh, a control, a get control from user space while your sensor is powered down, and you should pay attention not accessing the accuracy bus while uh, the sensor is powered off. Uh, there was support for frame interval handling. This is a kind of a request right now if you want to submit a uh, video for Linux driver. Frame handling is something that is kind of mandatory, doing that at least for a few frame rates. Um, that's another thing that calls for a shared state notation. So if your driver is streaming, uh, you, should refuse, you should return EBZ or another error flags if you want to set format or change the, inter, the frame interval. And the last change is the creation of the subdevice node that goes along with the support for the media controller operations. So I've been probably too fast. So we have 10 minutes for questions. I hope you have some at least because otherwise I've been really too fast. I had 100 slides, so I was worried that it was <laughs> that time was not enough, but actually I've been probably talking too fast. So if you have any question or anything you want to talk about or any question about any discussion about how things could evolve in not just for SOC camera based driver, but sensor driver in general, there are two microphones here, so please go ahead. Uh, 
So I'm just wondering, um, when you're writing this new code, you're adapting it, what sort of techniques you use for debugging and working out what's going wrong? Because it sort of strikes me as a more complex setup of everything being asynchronous, and when it's not working, you might not have much idea as to which bit isn't actually hooking up. So you get hungry, that's the first thing. No. No, well, I, I mean, you, you get disappointed when things doesn't well, work. That, that's say, yeah. the, the first debugging tool you use usually. <laughs> And, well, that depends totally on the system that you use, but things are now asynchronous, so having a notion, again, of what is the power state, that's always useful. And talking about streaming, start and stop, that's and now handled through the media controller frameworks. So you have a pipeline notation. The pipeline, it's, where's that? Uh, that's, it's basically a pipeline. All the components here are uh, put in a pipeline. And when you start streaming, the media controller frameworks goes one on the other and calls start, start stream on all of them. So having the bugging, adding the enabling the bugging, the media controller frameworks help you understanding what's going on at each step of the capture process. But in the end, you should just know what's happening in your sensor driver. If you have problems streaming, it depends on what problem you have. You don't receive images, you receive bad images, uh, you are missing a set format call, that depends on the driver usually, and, or you, and what the bugging tools your system provide, because compared to other parts of the system, it's hard to debug those kind of things using JTAG. Because well, there is an ice cream bus in the middle, so you should, the, the last resort is printing out all the messages you're sending on the ice cream bus, printing all of them, see what happened, go and go with the data sheet, and do the comparison. So there are different degrees of complexity you, you may want to handle. So I don't know if you have a specific use case for that or. Uh, well, um, maybe it's not that you give that. I may uh, we have time, so. About five minutes afterwards, <laughs> so that's okay. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so thank you. More time for, for coffee. <laughs>